everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here with us this weekend. Wherever you are, would you sing out with us as we worship God together?
welcome to Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us here. Whatever time you're watching, you are the church and we cannot wait to get into God's word with you. If we haven't met before, my name is Bianca Huber and I'm one of the campus pastors at our Bayville campus. If it is your first time here, thank you so much for checking us out. We would love to connect with you. If you're watching at Church Online, simply hit the connect button right above me. And if you're watching at any time on YouTube, right in the description is our digital connect card. Please fill that out and we will get in touch with you. And uh, we're to continue worshiping God here at Church Online through our tithes and offerings. We just wanna say thank you to everybody who has continued to faithfully give. Thank you so much. You make church possible week in, week out. You make it possible for us to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. We just wanna say thank you so much for your obedience and your generosity. And it's super easy to give here at Church Online. If you're watching a Church Online platform, hit the give button right above me. And if you're watching later on on YouTube, the give link is always in the description. Awesome. So we have some really cool news at New Beginnings, some cool uh, new things happening. We have Pastor Joe Source, our lead pastor, and Pastor Jerry Ball, one of our assistant pastors, has some awesome news to share with you. So let's check it out. Hey, everybody. It's Pastor Joe from New Beginnings. I'm here with Dr. Jerry Ball, who's one of our staff pastors here. And for the past couple of years, we've been contemplating how we as a church could help our families in supplementing the education of their children. Jerry, why don't you explain what we've come up with, what we believe yeah. uh, the Holy Spirit has led us into, and, and honestly, we can't really call it anything else but Spirit-led. Yes. Uh, we could have never known the timing involved here. And, and let's just tell everybody what, um, what we're planning on uh, introducing. Yeah, good, thanks, Pastor. I am, our team that we have, put together here at New Beginnings, we are super excited to announce to you today the launch of New Beginnings Co-op Learning Center. Amen. We have been like racehorses at the gate, ready for the gate to be open. So what is the New Beginnings Co-op Learning Center? It is the church through our, our, our children's ministry coming alongside parents and, and getting together with you and offering um, for one day a week on Thursdays, a chance for parents and their children K through six to come here to the church. We've got classes, social events uh, ready to launch and you become part of your children's lives here at the church. They're given an opportunity to socialize with other kids, to, 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 to just get away from the screens for a while. But it's not a matter of you coming and your children come here and you go away. It's a matter of you coming and as volunteers, we help We're you working together. interact with your children because that's what Jesus wants. He wants families. He doesn't want us to be, you're over here and your children are Separation. stuck in front yeah. of a screen. We're going to give you all the opportunities to reconnect through the ministries of the right. church. So right. it's, just, it's, it's a supplemental program. We realize the stress that so many parents have come under. Now, having to, some, some have had to quit their jobs. And, yes. and some all of a sudden now have become teachers with never really having had teaching experience. Mm -hmm. And there's so much confusion. Which school is open? Which school is not? What days a week are they going in person? What days are they online? Some parents have chosen uh, to just strictly homeschool their children. Yep. One way or the other, we recognize we want to be able to be here for our families, to be able to come alongside them and to help. We feel like this is a great opportunity for this the is, families. You said it we earlier. We hope that um, it's Holy Spirit driven. Holy Spirit led. It's for now. Yeah, definitely for now. And definitely uh, look at this. We want you to look at this as, as a supplement. The church coming alongside all of our individual families who are in this position right now. We want to make available to you the resources that we have. We want to make an opportunity, create an opportunity for your children to learn even more uh, than just sitting in front of the screen all day long. Mm -hmm. And for you to be personally involved in the spiritual growth, the academic growth of your children. Yes. If you're watching this in person, obviously you can come to any of us after service yeah. and we'll answer the questions that you have. Yeah. I will be in the lobby. Please hunt me down. Amen. Amen.
We're super excited for our Learning Center and Co-op. If, if you're a parent, this is for you. Please check it out on our website, newbeginningsnj.org forward slash co dash op. Check it out, it's gonna be awesome. And today we are getting into our new series, Six Things Jesus Said. We are so excited for this series. This is part one with our lead pastor, Joe Source, all about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Let's get into God's word together here at Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Joe Source. We're gonna be starting a new series this weekend. And I'd like to start that series by telling you a story from scripture. In John chapter 12, it tells us something that took place on what we call Palm Sunday or the triumphal, triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. He comes in as a king, and it was great excitement, great commotion. Not only was the, the city filled with large crowds coming to celebrate Passover, but the entire city was buzzing because Lazarus, the man who had been raised from the dead, was there in the city. John chapter 12, verse 20. Now there was some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. At Passover time, people from all over the Roman Empire, all over the Middle East, the known world, would come to Jerusalem to celebrate. It was one of the feasts that was commanded in Scripture that every male should present himself in Jerusalem. Uh, the historian Josephus tells us that anywhere from a million to a million and a half people would descend on that area of, around Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire. So, so here there are, among those are some Greeks, Greek-believing individuals who came up to worship at the festival. And verse 21 says, They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Now it's interesting that they would go to Philip, Philip is not a Hebrew name. Philip is a Greek name. So they must have sensed some connection with, with him. But the interesting thing here is this. Their request was, we would like to see Jesus. King James actually says it this way. We would see Jesus. And maybe Philip could have thought, because I would have thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't you want to see the beautiful temple? Don't you want to go on a tour don't you want to see the temple? Don't you want to see all the surrounding buildings? Don't you want to examine this beauty? Or, or better yet, wait a second, wait a second. Don't you want to see the man who was raised from the dead? That wasn't their request. They said, we want to see Jesus. They must have understood that without him, the temple has no meaning. They must have concluded that it would be better to meet the man who raised the dead than to meet the man who had been raised from the dead. He, Jesus, needs to be the center and needs to be the focus of our lives. These Greek believers, Jews, understood the most important thing that they needed right now in their lives was not to tour a building who they wouldn't know at the time would be demolished within the next 30 years. They didn't need to see a man who was raised from the dead. They needed to see the one. They needed to know the one. They needed to develop a relationship with the one who could raise the dead. Matthew chapter 14, 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Look at this picture here. When Peter saw the wind, he became afraid and began to sink. 
Who begins to sink? You either sink or you, or, you, or you walk on water. But as soon as he got his focus off of Jesus, he began to sink. Let me flip that. As long as he kept his focus on Jesus, he walked on water. He did the impossible. He overcame impossible odds as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. This series is designed for us to, no matter what wind is blowing, no matter what waves are buffeting us, it's designed for us to get our eyes back on Jesus. Over these next six weekends, we're going to focus on six different things that Jesus said, six statements that were made by our Savior. The idea is as long as we keep our eyes on him, we can overcome impossible odds. Maybe there's some of us that need to rekindle that first love. Maybe there's some of us that have gotten so caught up in, 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 in what's happening uh, in the political scene, what's happening on the national scene, the international scene, what's happening in your own household. Maybe you're one that's overcome by all the fear and, and, and the danger and, and the threats of this virus and, and violence and confusion and your just mind has been reeling and you, don't, you, you can't even sleep at night. It's time, church, to get our eyes back on Jesus. It's time for us to be as wise as those Greek men that came to Jerusalem on Passover and said, yeah, the building is beautiful. Yeah, this is cool that this guy got raised from the dead, but we would see Jesus. I pray that throughout these next six weeks that you'll stay connected with us. I pray throughout these next six weeks that you'll allow the Holy Spirit to once again to bring Jesus to the front and center of our lives. That's the goal of this series, is placing our attention upon our Lord, our Savior, our healer, our deliverer, our peace, our strength, the very center and the focus of our salvation. I want to start this first weekend with Jesus' most important declaration that he ever made throughout his ministry. So we're going to go to John chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse 1. Remember, this takes place at the Last Supper. This takes place on the night before Jesus goes to the cross. Verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places, we could say. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Here's that statement that just stands out all throughout of eternity. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is one of the seven great I am declarations of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, let's understand the context here. It's the Last Supper. Jesus is both preparing the disciples for his departure as well as inviting them to come into an everlasting relationship with himself. The fact is, we know from, from studying ancient Jewish culture, Jesus is using the language of a marriage proposal. In order for a man to be married, he had to guarantee a home for the newlyweds to live in. That home was usually built on the groom's father's house. They would make an addition to the existing home. The father supervised that addition. And only when the father gave his approval and declared the, the dwelling to be complete, only then could the groom go and get his bride. Acts chapter 1, Jesus made this statement. I'm also going to start in verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. They would have understood the context. 
they, they would have connected it to the statements that he would have made, that he did make at the Last Supper. What makes this statement even more exciting is that the region of Galilee, where Jesus and most of his disciples lived and grew up, had a particular marriage custom. This particular marriage custom involved the groom going to get his bride. When the groom went unannounced to the bride's house, he would be followed with and accompanied by many of his friends and family members. There would be the shout of a shofar, that ancient trumpet, that would wake up that neighborhood and declare the groom is coming. But what's more fascinating and what's, what's more just so telling and and has such deep richness to the symbolism is what happens next. You see, when the groom came to the bride's house and finally arrived there, the bride was not allowed to walk to her new home. The bride, according to Galilean custom, and especially in Nazareth, the bride had to be carried on a litter, on a, on a pallet. She was not, her feet were not to touch the ground. She was to be carried to the, her new home. She was to be carried to the home of her groom's father. In fact, it was referred to as flying the bride home. This is a picture of the rapture of the church. When all of God's people will be removed from the earth in an instant, when the church, the bride of Christ, meets the groom in the air, how much more rich symbolism could we, could we require to see how special this time is going to be? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. And we could say it this way. I am the way to the Father's house. I am the way to your new home. No one comes to the Father's house except through me. In other words, I'm the groom. You're the bride. You're the church. The disciples understood clearly what he was saying to them. There is no other way to the Father's house except through the groom. At the Last Supper, the the disciples were being told, the only way you're going to get into the presence of the Father is through me, Jesus said. The bride can only get into her new home accompanied by the groom, and she had to be carried into his presence. The day's going to come, church, when that promise is going to be fulfilled, when we will meet our Savior, our Lord. We'll meet him in the air. We, the bride, will be carried into his presence. Now, the apostle Peter, having been there that night, that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through me echoed his words. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He's saying it's the only name. That's the only name. He's the groom. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Nobody comes to the Father except him. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, backs up the same claim. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there was one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Passion translation says it this way. For God is one, and there was one mediator between God and the sons of men, the true man, Jesus, the anointed one. Verse 6 goes on to say, he gave himself as a ransom payment for everyone. Now is the proper time for God to give the world this witness. And man, that scripture is so much more important today than it was even back then. Now is the time for the church to give witness to the rest of this world that there's one mediator between God and us. He is the one assigned by God to take upon himself all of our sins. He is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He is the Passover Lamb. Now, how can can Jesus claim to be the only way to God? The famous English atheist turned theologian, C.S. Lewis, had this to say. 
To understand why this is so, we must go back to the beginning. An infinite personal God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And then man in his own image, Genesis chapter 1, 26. When he had finished creating everything, it was good, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Man and women were placed in a perfect environment with all their needs taken care of. They were given only one prohibition. There was only one thing forbidden. They were not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest they die. Genesis 2, 17. Unfortunately, they did eat of the tree. Genesis chapter 3. And the result was a fall in four different areas. The relationship between God and man was now broken, as can be seen from Adam and Eve's attempting to hide from God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. The relationship between man and his fellow man was severed with both Adam and Eve arguing, trying to place blame to someone else. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that story. The bond between man and nature also was broken with the ground producing thorns and thistles and the animal world, world no longer being benevolent. Animals were no longer tame and kind. They became man-eaters, they became violent. Man also became separated from himself. His soul became damaged. With a feeling of emptiness and incompleteness, something he had not experienced before the fall. However, God promised to make all these things right and gave his word that he would send a savior or a Messiah who would deliver the entire creation from the bondage of sin. We find that promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The Old Testament kept repeating the theme that someday this person would come into the world and set mankind free. God's word did indeed come true. God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ, John chapter 1. Jesus eventually died in our place in order that we could enjoy again a right relationship with God. The Bible says God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself, and he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus has paved the way. God has done it all. Our responsibility is to accept that fact. We can do nothing to add to the work of Jesus. It has all been done for us. He himself claimed to be the way, the way out of sin, the way into the Father's embrace, the way out of fear, the way out of addiction, out of hatred, out of darkness. Only someone who was alive can lead us on that path. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Again, I want to quote C.S. Lewis. He shares a great illustration. Suppose a group of us are taking a hike in a very dense forest. As we get deeper into the forest, we become lost. Realizing that taking the wrong path now might mean we will lose our lives, we begin to be afraid. However, we soon notice that ahead in the distance, where the trail splits, there are two human forms at the fork in the road. Running up to these people, we notice that one has a park ranger uniform, and he is standing there perfectly healthy and alive, while the other person is lying face down, dead. Now, which of these two are we going to ask the way out of this forest? Obviously, the one who is living. When it comes to eternal matters, we're going to ask the one who was alive the way out of our predicament. This is not Mohammed. This is not Confucius. This is not any religious leader from the past. Why? They are all dead. But this is Jesus Christ. Jesus is unique in the fact that he came back from the dead. This demonstrates that he is the one who he claimed to be. He is the way to everlasting life. John chapter 1, verse 11 says this. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become 
children of God, to those who believe in his name. I want to bring you back to the very beginning of this teaching. The Greeks came to Jerusalem during the Passover feast, busiest time of the year in Jerusalem. And so Philip may have been thinking they're just like other tourists that come during this time of the year. But they were unique. They weren't dazzled by the sights. They weren't dazzled by the celebrity Lazarus. Their intention was, we want to see Jesus. Church, life is busy right now. There is so much that's vying for our attention, so much that wants us to focus on instead of focusing on the very source of life himself, the source of peace, the source of victory. You and I have to make a choice on a daily basis. Where am I going to set my focus? Psalm 91 says, because he, God speaking about man, because he, man, has set his affection on me, I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Where are you setting your affection? Where, are, where is your focus? Are you, are you just trying to survive right now? Are you busy building a career? Are you busy pursuing relationships? Are you busy just trying to tread water? Just trying to keep one nostril above? Ask yourself this question. Where have I set my affection? Affection must be set. If our affections are allowed to wander, they will attach themselves, our affection will attach itself to things that are going to, that we believe may try to fulfill our lives. We might set, set our affection. Uh, it might attach itself to something that fulfills and gratifies me now, but can cost me in the future. But if you and I will be very intentional about our lives and intentional about where am I setting my affection, what is my order of priorities in my life? Is God first? Is the word of God what forms my base of values in this life? Or am I being, being torn left and right? Am I being pulled in this direction by this thing that's, uh, that's trying to rob my attention? Am I being pulled by what's popular today? Or do I have my affection set on an eternal, everlasting foundation? And that foundation is John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to see the Father, if you want to experience everlasting life, if you want to be, feel that embrace of welcome home, he said, you're going to need to focus on me. Jesus didn't say that because he's some egotistical narcissist. He said that for your benefit and for my benefit. Adam and Eve had a great life as long as their affection was set upon their God, their creator. As soon as their affection, their attention, their focus was distracted to a serpent's voice. They began to believe the lies. The in, only intention of those lies were to take their affection off of our creator and set on the deceiver. Whenever you and I take our affection and set it on anything else, except the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. We are in danger of falling into deception. He is truth. There is no other truth. He is truth. Well, I see it this way and I see it that way. However you see it, I see things, unless they line up with the word of God, are not going to produce life in us, are not going to cause us to 
come into relationship with our Creator, our Father in heaven. We will wander and our affections will wander and they will, seek, they will seek to attach themselves to something that may gratify now, but may cost us an eternity. I pray that the truth of, of what Jesus said, this very first statement that we're concentrating on, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I pray that that is an established fact in your life. Maybe you're watching this, and it may be just one of many things that you're watching and searching, trying to find some truth. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will take that statement that came from the lips of Jesus and will penetrate your heart with it. And you will know on the inside what Jesus said is the absolute truth. He is the way. And having that revelation impact you on the inside, I pray that your very next step would be to fulfill the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. To as many as received him, Jesus, to as many as receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. Do you want to be a child of God? Do you want to live the rest of your life from this point forward with the sense of security that you're going to see the Father someday, that you're going to experience his embrace when you take your last breath here on this earth, that you won't be in danger of spending your entire eternity forever and ever and ever separated from that embrace, that you, if you finally want to find truth, if you finally want to experience life, if you're ready to turn your back on everything that this world has to offer, then I would ask you to say this prayer with me. Repeat this with me wherever you are. Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of this world. I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe that you, Father, raised Jesus from the dead, and he's alive right now. So I pray, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. I receive you as my Savior. I receive you as my Lord. I believe in your name. Thank you for making me a child of God. Thank you that I have the security now to know that when I take my last breath, I will be forever in your presence. Thank you. I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.